Welcome to the High Strangers Factor. Obviously, I'm not Steve Ward. I'm Andy Mercer. He's an occasional co-host and producer of the show. Steve's actually out on the road at the moment, attending various conferences and giving talks at those events. So I've stepped in with a different kind of show tonight. Earlier this year, I was interviewed by the three ladies who make up the Six Degrees of John Keel, Barbara, Kendra and Morgana. And we discuss things such as magic and the occult in the world of the paranormal and topics along those lines. Um, they've given me permission to rebroadcast that interview as a show for the High Strangers Factor. So hopefully you enjoy this evening's um, slightly different show. Steve will be back in two weeks' time with another of his usual shows with possibly me as co-host or possibly not. You never know. I never know until we get to the show. But hopefully you'll enjoy tonight's little rather different show. Hello and welcome to the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Barbara Fisher, and with me is... Morgana. Tonight we have a return guest. We have Andy Mercer. He's an author and a psychotherapist. He's coming to us from England. Hello. Hello. How's things over there? Uh, it's much better than it was the last time we talked. Oh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> raining. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it is kind of like... like kind of english weather here it's 50 degrees and raining in ohio so oh Lord. Yes, it's um yeah has been pretty damp most of this spring here we've had literally yesterday and today the only decent days you've had in well, so far this year really it has been quite warm and pleasant we've had some decent weather but the wind's been cold we've had a really kind of cold snap of the wind it's been a pretty awful uh, spring for us but it's finally getting a little bit better now so not so bad yeah, Ohio decided to do this weird thing where it's March for, what, two months? And mm -hmm. then we had a week of August. Oh. <laughs> so it was beastly hot and humid and nasty. And now we're back to March. Yep. So someday May might actually happen. Yeah. Maybe June. I'm not sure. Actually, you know, that, that sounds about right. For us, we've been stuck at about March, you know, sort of March weather. It's not been too bad. It's been a bit wet, not too cold, but not really warm. Yeah, we've been March for about three months, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Morgana, why don't you introduce our topic, what we're going okay. to try to talk about? Um, or the... we'll talk about the weather for an hour and a half. I mean, yeah, we can do both. Well, the um... British know to talk about the weather, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> We're known for that one, so. <laughs> I think we talk about the weather in America too. Um, probably yeah. not as much, though. We're not famous for it. Well, ours changes so often. That's the thing of this country because because we're next to the Atlantic, of course. So we're the second larger landmass after Ireland that is hit by all the weather that comes across the Atlantic. That's why it suddenly changes when it gets to land because the air temperature changes and all that. So we get all sorts of weather with the rain and what have you. But yeah. Now, Elizabeth, see, I told you, the British know about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, now I've got the giggles. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> hmm. All right. So the topic, which we will probably take a hard left turn and get off topic, um, was ritual magic as a human-driven contact modality. Right. So do you want to discuss what a contact modality is? Sure. So a contact modality is the way in which a non-human intelligence and a human intelligence end up interacting. So things like abductions or hearing voices or mediumship or an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, hmm. among others. So we were... First off, we we know that you know a lot about ritual magic because of your books mm -hmm. and because, as I recall, you're you're a, a practitioner. Yes. So on the quiet. <laughs> so could you talk about how ritual magic works? Right. Well, I can really talk mainly about what I do because obviously. And there's not, many different. Yeah, exactly. It's not a hard and fast set way of doing things. Although some would say there is, that the very specific rules have to be followed for a particular ritual invocation. Which, again, yeah, there is something to that because, of course, it's all about history here of hundreds of years of practitioners using ritual magic that you can find in grimoires. Excuse me, <clears throat> grimoires of magic that give you specific instructions of day times or what you should do and that kind of thing. I'm more of a uh, what you might call a scryer, 
or a seer in terms of I like to communicate via crystal and that sort of thing. Invocation into a crystal to actually communicate that way. That's been my personal experience predominantly over the years of working that way, both with traditional grimoires that talk about um, crystal invocation, particularly things like Dr. John Dean and Knocking Magic, which I've actually written about, which is based really around crystal scrying work and what comes out from that. But also the more classic grimoire spirits and entities communicating with those via a crystal, either and again, this is an area of debate whether the, the spirit entity being, whatever you want to call it, comes into the crystal and you communicate directly looking at the crystal, or in fact, it's happening in your mind and the crystal is like a thing you focus on, but it's actually happening in your head. You know, that might seem like a very straightforward point of dif differentiation between the two, but of course it does mean quite a bit of difference. And if you are believing that you've got a genuine spirit, entity, energy, whatever you want to call it, and I always say it that way, I never use one label, I use several at the same time. But if it's something that is entering the crystal, are you dealing with a separate discrete entity from yourself that actually exists and is now communicating through the crystal as if it was some kind of radio or tv or or mobile phone or are you dealing with something that's coming from the collective unconscious not an individual mind but a, a collective unconscious level there's a it's a, it the, this spirit entity is a part of the archetypal structure of the unconscious is that what you're actually communicating with you know, some people will say absolutely one or the other, but definitively that's definitely what you're dealing with, either A or B. But we can't know. You can't be absolutely certain of which way around it is. I personally don't necessarily subscribe to the notion that these are separate entities that exist by themselves independently of us. My thinking has become very much more that these things exist, but they take on forms that work with what you're working with. So, for example, if you're working, for example, with a knocking magic and the knocking entities, that's what appears to come through. But if you're working with more, say, Solomonic magic or a Goetic magic, the names of entities that you're working with there, they will come through as well. Now, they're different pantheons, if you like. They're different forms. So do they exist simultaneously? Or are they the same but coming across differently because of the way you're approaching them. That doesn't mean they have their own identity that's entirely separate, but they are taking it on the identity that you give them, but then they work that way because you've given them that identity. So <clears throat> in terms of what I do with ritual invocation, I say it's mainly crystal scrying, it is more a case of bringing whatever it is into that crystal to communicate. So it and it, it fits in the, the, that broader picture of you, you're communicating with something. Well, what exactly it is, again, I wouldn't like to be too definitive about what I think because I don't know. I really don't know. Even after 30 years, I know these things seem to respond when you question and you get a sense of an answer. And it's, it's a bit like a conversation we were having earlier on. You can say, well, is it just imagination in your head or are you having some kind of psychotic moment of some disembodied voice speaking in your head well no you don't hear it like a conversation you have a sense of what's being communicated to you you feel it more than you hear it i mean some people will say to you yes i'm definitely hearing this this voice and it sounds like x y z and yet to them it might do that might be how it manifests itself as if it was a voice in the head that is literally like um tapping into some radio signal that's then talking to you or that kind of intuitive feeling about something, the the sense of a presence. The best way I can describe it is that sense of presence, that there is something there. It isn't just your imagination. It isn't just you generating it yourself subconsciously. There's something going on there. So I don't know if that answered the question there. I didn't want to use a wandering off. I Even if it didn't, it was absolutely interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, could you explain a little bit about the difference between, um, the goetic, uh, cre uh, um, entities and the, the Enochian ones? Well, yes. I mean, it becomes a bit more of a kind of history of magic session because, Starting with the Goetic stuff and Solomonic, it's all part of a great of a larger picture of what you'd call the ceremonial magic, the magical invocation using um, magical circles to bring things into the circle. Now, depending on which text you work with, you've got descriptions of angelic or demonic beings. They've got different names and different sigils which you would use depending on which text you're looking at. I mean, one example is like the, the Book of Solomon. There's the greater key of Solomon. There are probably, a, well, there are over 20 different versions of that that are known to exist. 
they all have similar ideas in them. Some of the names are different. Some of the schedules are different. The approach is a little different in some of those as well. So it's not there's no one specific text you can work with. There are early versions you can trace back, but most of them go back to medieval times. There is one text called the Hygromantia, which may be earlier, maybe 6th, 7th century, as possibly the, the origins of some of this stuff, some of the magic. There's the Testament of Solomon, which goes back to about the 3rd century, which includes a whole list of demons that Solomon is supposed to control with this magic ring. So, that, But it's all kind of almost lost in the midst of time. There's no specific one text you can say those where it begins at that point. With John D and the Nokian system, it's completely different. We have a, a beginning point. We have an absolute concrete date in which he began to use a guy called Edward Kelly as a scryer, seeing things in the crystal ball and dictating what Kelly would do is dictate what he was seeing in the crystal ball would tell John D and John D would write it down. You've got the beginning point, the actual concrete historical moment in which what was he called an, his angelic communications. He, the word of knocking is something that he did later on. He saw himself as talking to angels. But again, it was the same kind of thing. Kelly would look into the crystal and describe to D what he was seeing. Kelly was seeing visually in the crystal entities appearing um, spirits would show him various things and shapes and objects and numbers and, and the Enochian language as well, how to write it down. He was literally seeing that in the crystal. So that has a very definite beginning point. So that, that's probably the biggest difference. I mean, it, it kind of fits with the broader picture of ceremonial magic of the time because they, there's quite a detailed setup that Dee was told to use in order to create the communications, which included a large table with various sigils carved onto the table, a cloth over that, and then a thing called the Sigillium, Sigillium, Sigillium DMF, my teeth are falling out. And that was a very specific design that he had to use. And very early on, he was told by a spirit entity that one of the existing grimoires that D owned had a version that they could use of a, of a large sigil. Later on, they then dictated to D their own version, which on the surface looks similar to the one he was told to use. And I'm racking my brain to which book it comes from, and it's completely gone. But it was based on a pre-existing version. But then the angels gave him a different version that looked similar, but was a lot more complex, a lot more involved. So there was a sense of continuity there because it was using that same kind of imagery, but also a fresh start because the design was more complex and different in certain areas. D himself was trying to communicate with angel and angelic beings in order to get the book of Enoch which was a lost book of the Bible, which at the D's time was known was not known of at all, had been lost completely. Subsequent years in the 1700s, it turned up. There was an Ethiopian version, there's an East European version, and they are later books. Again, old material, but they, they do actually exist. But what D got as part of his communication work was a way of connecting with the Enochian realms, actually visiting these entities' own realms of existence, if you like, planes of existence. So it again comes back to the idea of are you going to a real place that exists somewhere out there or some alternate reality? Possibly. Or are you doing are you getting deep within the personal and collective subconscious, the lowest levels of collective unconsciousness, where these archetypal existence can be found if you like that you're going deep within yourself and finding these places i mean my own personal experiences of working with that exploration i found myself seeing places and making notes obviously of what they looked like and back in the days when i was working very much on my own it was just me and the books i had I didn't know anybody else interested in this sort of stuff i made my notes a little bit later on when the internet started to become available at university <clears throat> I was able to find other websites that talked about Enochian magic and them describing what their experiences were. And I noticed definite similarities. We were describing similar places that had similar beings, entities in them, but also others that were very, very different. But what was interesting, and um, Alistair Crowley, I'm sure you've heard of before, he had his own experience of, ex of exploring the Enochian realms. His descriptions, again, were quite different. But I, I began to realize that what they were seeing was influential influenced by who they were as a person that made a difference to their experience of these places so again there's a fluidity again of what you're experiencing though there are certain core elements that are the same the details vary from person to person depending on the person's own experiences so that kind of i found was fascinating as well so as well as having 
with the more historic grimoire magic of different beings entities described similarly or differently and experiences being similar or different depending on your approach so it was happening with the knocking stuff as well so there was no fixed this is what this person is this is what this being does and how it acts you know you have <clears throat> some of the older grimoires you have the same being being named with different attributes doing different things so which is the real version of themselves you, you can't know because you get these two texts who are of a similar age with a the same name or very similar name describing them acting and being different so which is a real one so you know you can't nail it down saying this is absolutely what, what they do again no that's the question <laughs> no you did answer it and um it it reminds me a little bit when you talk about how you saw places in the enochian realms and you wrote it down and then you you met people on the internet and what they had experienced was similar. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Michael Harner's uh, work in shamanic practice where he and other shamanic practitioners are essentially mapping the underworld mm -hmm. that shamanic practitioners go to. Yes. And so there is similarity, but you're absolutely right. It is very different. I know in my case, when I've done shamanic work for myself, my underworld looks like itself. It looks like someplace mm -hmm. like the forest primeval. It's, right. it's, it's somewhere between West Virginia and <laughs> Wales. You right. know, it's, it's something like that. Maybe a little bit of Scotland thrown in there, mm -hmm. but. Um, when I work for someone else, if I am going to retrieve something for someone else, it changes because yeah. I'm going on behalf of someone else. So I remember I was, I was to retrieve a spirit ally for a friend and I ended up in a jungle and I was like, what is happening here? This is nothing like where I've ever been. And, um, I ended up with a, a female jaguar that was pregnant and oh, I could wow. tell she was pregnant because her belly was huge and it was moving around. Like you could see the, the little cubs sort of moving underneath the way that sometimes you can see with women's bellies, you can sort of see a head sort of push against it when they're very pregnant. So Which I brought it back. Huh? <laughs> Which is creepy. It when is when that creepy, happens. Very alien. Like, you know, so I brought it back and I, blew it into her as I was supposed to. And I, I was still confused. What I didn't know was she had just found out that she was pregnant and that she had problems with fibro or not fibro, fibroid tumors. Right. So there was <clears throat> this, she needed the strength of something. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that she was pregnant. So, that made sense. Mm, and absolutely. and she she very much liked Central America. So it, it probably wasn't a South American jungle. It was probably Central America. Um, but she was like, oh, yeah, I love the jungle in, in, in Central America. She's like, I've been there a couple of times. I'm like, OK, good, because mm. that's where I found myself. And I was very confused. And my spirit allies were like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> this is <laughs> new and different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my fox was very much going, I, I don't even. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's taking a wrong turn somewhere. It's interesting yeah. because one of the things that, again, researching other material that's come up for me is um, – Bit more background, make more more sense. Like one of the other books I've written, which I've mentioned before, was the Wicked Shoulder K, which is that collection of spells and charms, the genuine historic uh, documents from mainly from the Folklore Society publications of the 1800s. Well, alongside those, there are lots of very strange description of weird events. I think we might have talked a bit about this a bit last time, but what I you get is a sense of these strange happenings that are often 
associate with underground, under under the surface, that these beings appear from nowhere as if they come from under a hill somewhere. Whereas in modern times, the similar kind of parallels would be like alien experiences where they've come from the sky instead. It's almost as if there has to be a source for them that's more real worldly in the sense they have to have come from somewhere. Books of old, it was very much coming from under under the ground and appearing from nowhere, but they've come from under the surface of the earth. Whereas as I say now it's from above in the sky, but then they're just seen there in front of them. But some of the descriptions, particularly didn't say they came from anywhere as if they literally just appeared, which again, I found quite fascinating. So the idea of, is it again, a manifestation of something that we're experiencing or are these real beings from other parallel realities that have suddenly appeared before us? And some of the, the, the stranger ones are always that kind of thing. They appear from nowhere and then disappear. There's no kind of spaceship involved or anything like that, or the ground opening up. They've just appeared. And those are some of the most fascinating stories that I've come across in that research as well. So, the, the again, it's, it's one of those things. It's like we've got to find an explanation for where these things are coming from in order to understand them more. But if they're just appearing and then they're not there anymore, we aren't going to have the answer to where they've come from, why they've suddenly appeared. It's just that they do. And it's, you know, just trying to make it more seem like a logical reason. Well, therefore, obviously, they've come from outer space in their spacecraft. They've come down and they've perhaps binged me up into their ship or they've taken me on board and now they've put me back down on the ground. But you don't tend to get that. Often with alien abduction stories, I notice quite often that you have a description of them being abducted and taken away. But then there's no story about them brought back. They just sort of wake up in bed or wake up somewhere as if they've been just teleported straight back. Well, if they can teleport you, why do they come and get you? They can just teleport you there and back. <laughs> that, that I always found was quite fascinating as well. Where they, the, the, the descriptions of them being taken away are very detailed, but the descriptions of being brought back are largely absent as far as I've seen. I mean, there might be examples that other people know about, but again, from my own reading, I haven't come across too many of those. And I found that's fascinating as well, the way that you know, how it's the, the mechanics, if you like, of what's going on. I wonder if the reason they don't come from, they, I've, to me, the sky and under the earth are, there's a symbolic barrier there mm. um, that just, that makes it a place that we can't easily go. Mm -hmm. And before in, in historical, in history, you know, under the ground was not something you did. Hmm. Like you had mines and that was it. And mines and caves, mines and caves. And they yeah. were infested with things like knockers and goblins oh, yeah. Yeah. and all kinds of really creepy things. Hmm. But now the sky is sort of our barrier. Yes. Because we, we very much are good at earthworks now. Um, and a lot of our industrial focus now is on breaking the barrier of the atmosphere of our planet and going to other planets. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if things coming from the sky now aren't a reflection of us reaching out to break through that new barrier. Yeah, I think you can also say it, it's what's unknown. For yeah generations about the earth under the earth was unknown it wasn't explored so we had caves which you'd get you know further back in time you'd be worried about even exploring a cave because if you had a, a flaming light the only source you had was a flaming torch and that gets blown out or something you're in the pitch black in the underground you're probably not going to make it out alive so it's liable to be quite a scary place certainly again we have an almost inbuilt to a certain degree of fear of the dark naturally because we are sight oriented creatures we're predators so our sight is primary so you lose that um, ability then the other senses we have are not as good so the idea of being trapped underground by going into a cave is pretty scary but in modern times now it's less of an issue so they're not as unfamiliar anymore so you need to find something else that becomes the unfamiliar territory, which is say up in the sky, however far up you're, you're able to go. So that's probably part of it as well. That it still remains the unknown, the idea of being in space. Again, we have the conception of what space is about, what it is, but we've no. Most of us have no real experience of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't don't regularly take trips to Mars or anything just <laughs> yet. So even for modern people, it's still largely unknown. But what we know is predominantly based on science fiction. You know, those those kind of things. We don't have any direct experience or ever like to have that direct experience unless you have to be incredibly wealthy and get on Virgin Galactic. You know, that's the only chance you're ever going to find out. 
so yeah, the idea of the otherness of the sky and being the more likely source now for otherworldly beings, because again, the earth is much smaller in the sense of how we perceive it compared to the times past. And a better understanding of what is underground I, is pretty solid, though, unlike the things are dwelling down there, apart from in caves, obviously. So again, it's, it's more familiar now. So the idea of being that big vast out there of space makes more sense as being the source of the unknown entity that's coming to you. That makes more sense. Yeah. It's here there be dragons. Mm. You know, it's it's space is the map margin now, I think, yes. in a yeah. lot of ways. Absolutely. And that makes that makes a lot of sense. In in shamanic work, you go to the underground, to the underworld, but you can also go into the upper realm, into the upper worlds, the celestial realm. Different things live up there. Um None of them seem to be like space aliens, though. But um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there were some, but I haven't met them. Uh, but you know, it's it's there's always been the those two places where things come from: the underworld and the celestial realm. Sure, I mean, so, it's yeah. one of the things that's fascinating to me: is the underworld itself is a is a bit of a fascination because I. As you, may know i've just recently written a book on about dante's inferno which of course is dante's exploration of the underworld going through the various layers and levels and for me again that that was a fascination and it's almost like it's, again it's kind of been lost as the idea of the the dangers of the underworld has been kind of superseded by this idea of dangers from outer space i mean you i know that i don't know if it's still a thing but there was that talk with a space agency thing that um Trump was setting up of was going to look into possible th threats and dangers from outer space with a logo that looked very much like the star trek logo if I remember rightly. Yeah. So it, yeah. it seems being taken relatively seriously, this idea of the possibility of being attacked from outer space. But again, I think it's all to do with science fiction. Way too much sci-fi has got into people's heads, this belief that, you know, it's kind of we have to protect ourselves against the possibility that they're going to attack us. Well, I think in reality, and I'm probably going to annoy a few of your guests, but if we do genuinely encounter aliens from other planets, they're going to be so totally utterly different to us that we won't even perceive them as being a living entity they're going to be completely different you know with the whole idea that they're going to have the similar kind of height and build and you know two eyes and mouth and nose whatever so there might be different size proportions but they've all got those features they look relatively humanoid but when you're given how evolution works there's no reason why they look anything like that but yeah, we have this idea that they're going to, and I do think it, it is because it's part of that same history of the fairies, that the, those kind of things, trolls, they all fit that kind of general model of appearance. So you can look at one of two ways. Either they've always been here visiting us from wherever, and yet most of the older stories, as I said before, don't involve anything coming out of the sky. They're coming out of the ground, if they're coming from anywhere, coming out of caves, etc. So why have they suddenly gone from coming out of caves to coming out of the sky? Maybe they've always been here, and it's just that's the way we perceive them as moving amongst us. But the descriptions of what we're talking about tally too closely to how we look for it to be anything other than something that's to do with us, if you see what I mean. I think humans may just be, if this does have to do with collective unconscious, I think we may just be so unimaginative is almost the wrong word, but it's like we cannot conceive of a different shape for a sentient being. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. I think that's one of the issues that, that is raised when I read lots of reports about UFO abductions and the creatures they see. They're still humanoid in their description. I mean, but these things do change in time. I mean, our modern sort of conception of how an angel is supposed to look is based very much on sort of pre raphaelite paintings of yep. this sort of being in a white sort of dress with the bird's wings and they're otherwise looking normal with just huge wingspan. You read some of the biblical descriptions of angels, they look nothing like that. they got like four wings. Wings, wings covered in eyes, you know, multiple heads. They could completely different, they were very alien in the broader sense of the term compared to what humans look like. But yet they've changed in description. And again, the idea of this description, it fits kind of what we understand as being more likely to be the case that they're going to look humanoid because they can we can relate to that idea. But as I say, it's almost like sort of not really thinking it through properly. It's, it's, got to, it's got to fit with what we expect it to look like. Therefore, it must look this way. 
but there's no reason why it should at all. Yeah, my my favorite the my my issue with angels, my favorite thing about angels is they always have to say be not afraid. Mm. And there's a reason. Yeah. Because yeah, if you see something with four heads, extra eyes, hundreds of wings, spurting flame. <laughs> exactly. You could have been afraid. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, I think running away is a natural reaction. <laughs> Absolutely, or, yes. Yeah, or just bowing down and being like, whatever, mm. you win, clearly. <laughs> whatever you are. <laughs> no, <laughs> you are above my weight class for yeah. this fight. Yeah. I can't. I just, yeah. I don't even know. I retired <laughs> yeah. <up> now. <laughs> and that's how they're described. Yeah, yeah. Except for when they're described basically just as men, mm. just as as people. And they they come in a humble, more humble sort of way. They don't have wings. They just, you know, look like people. Yes. And then, of course, you have to ask the question, well, why are you an angel then? You look exactly like a human being. You could just be calling yourself an angel, couldn't you? <laughs> well, see, and then they turn into that be not afraid shape again. And then yeah. you go, why did I say <laughs> that? So, yeah, <laughs> you know, why did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> You know, Abraham didn't do that, and we're probably Sarah probably would have smacked him for it if he had. You know, <laughs> so, so when you when you converse with um, beings in the in the crystal, yeah, how do you? What sort of information do you gain? Um, and and how do you? How do you use that information? I mean, in a funny way, I don't do much with it. It's it's been a while since I've done anything. To be perfectly honest, you're just sort of kind of thinking back with the knocking specifically. It was just re-verifying those experiences. It was going to those realms of which they appear to be coming from, and seeing what I could see. Um, I don't particularly ask anything when I think about it. It's more of a kind of oh wow, it worked. <laughs> There's some. <something there. laughs> Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> it's almost like a plum. Yeah, that's nice to see you there. So thank you. Hello, have a little wave, and off they go again. You know, I don't, I don't look for like asking for the the um, predicting the future or anything like that because they don't do that. Basically, there's no just time. There's no such thing as time for them. That's an important point. I often try to get across. You know, you ask about what's going to happen next. They might kind of like, no, I don't know. <laughs> because for them, the time doesn't exist in that same way. I mean, there's been. I've been a few occasions when I have communicated with whatever's there to help somebody else out of a particular problem that I needed to deal with. Um, it's difficult. I don't want to get into too much detail here, but I've, I've, I've got rid of neighbours before, probably the strongest thing I've ever did, which was very, very effective, I have to say, on all three sides, either side and across the road. For different reasons, all three of them, honestly, were being a pain in the ass. But <laughs> <laughs> within i did something to try and hang on hang on you six demons or <laughs> angels on your neighbors because well, they were annoying i asked them to help me get rid of them shall we <laughs> i don't okay. know why they left but within the space of three months all three of them were moved out so we definitely but, i mean um, i tip my hat to you because that's that's some ama that's top tier messing with people and i'm here for that but well one side constantly used to park their car across my drive which is rather irritating oh, that's not the one across the road had a harley davidson which he'd set up turn it on leave it running for five ten minutes before getting on the thing and riding away with it neighbors used to complain because the noise of waking people up on the other side you'd have to see the light of our houses but unfortunately the way they're laid out is you often get people parking across your drive and they don't realize they're doing it and when you ask them if they'll move but the neighbor the other side the mum of the woman who lived there, she was an ass. Basically, she wouldn't. She was very difficult. So I thought, well, I'll ask for this help. If it works, great. If it doesn't, I tried. And I say, within a few months, all three sides have moved out, and the people who've moved in are much nicer. We get on the house by the guys one side of us, the other side are perfectly fine. The guy across the road is a great bloke. You know, all three of them. It's like, blimey. <laughs> <laughs> It worked, but it, it wasn't to make the head catch fire oh, no. or like that. It was just like, would you please assist with them leaving? Now, why they left, I don't know. But it is, if one person moved out, coincidence, 
two move out. Mm, okay. Three within a few months. No, something's going on here. Especially one of them been living for years, you know. They all went for good reasons. The guy next door, he decided to get moved into a smaller house as his kids had left home. The people on the other side wanted a bigger house as having more family. So we knew why both sides left. And it was for very good reasons. The guy across the road had no idea. Why. No one spoke to him. He'd been asked. But say, him and his motorbike left. So we were on good terms with both sides, the old neighbours. We got on fine with them. I mean, the guy who lived next door is actually passed away. But the other side, we still got Facebook friends and we exchanged Christmas cards and all that. We got on fine with them. It was her mother that was the bloody problem. So, you know, but most often it's just communication, almost like, you know, what, why does this work? You know, is this happening? Is this connection here? You're real? Yeah, I'm here. I'm talking to you. You know, what does your realm look like? Where have you come from? And then get an imagery of places, which I find fascinating. Again, you could easily sit and say, well, you're just imagining stuff and make it up in your head. Well, maybe you are. I mean, uh, Lon Marla Duquette is a really famous occultist, said, you know, this is all happening in your head, but you have no idea how big your head is. You know, how much is going on there? So it could be just that. But it feels it. It feels different. Is there any way I can describe it? Again, it could be complete self delusion. I wouldn't de- deny that totally. But it feels different. It's not like you're imagining things. It's not like you're making it up. Sometimes a way of looking at it is a little bit like with hypnosis, which I occasionally use in my work. When you remember something in hypnosis, it's far more real than just remembering it when you're conscious and awake. But in hypnosis, you're reliving the experience. You know it feels more real. I mean, people come and say, well, tell you that's what they feel. It feels more real. And the same with this stuff. It feels more real. It's like if you've been on a ghost investigation, you get a sense there's something in the room with you. It feels real, whether it's actually there in front of you or it's kind of you're connected with the place and whatever's there at the place, you can discuss. But there is a difference. You know something strange is going on. That's the best way I can describe it, really. No, I I understand that. Um, The few forays I've made into any form of structured magic. Um, I very quickly backed off on most of that because it worked. Mm -hmm. And it was startling. And also who, who or whatever it is that is connected to me it never gives you what you want. It gives you what you need. And sometimes that's unpleasant. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you got to confess now. What did you ask for? What happened? Um, okay. Did so I have, I asked with my whole soul for some peace and quiet and time off. Right. And, I have gotten horribly ill Mm -hmm. immediately after asking this and been laid up for a week with the flu. Um, The last time I asked it was right before the pandemic. And I just was like, you know what? I'm done asking for this. (laughs) (laughs) The entire world pandemic can be blamed on you. I know it can't be blamed on me. I don't think I did it. It was just a creepy coincidence. (laughs) It sounds like it. You said it yourself. It sounds like it. (laughs) And now in all seriousness, it is something you have to be careful of. Again, genuine true story of someone I do actually know who asked exactly that kind of question. I wanted to give, spend more time working with magic and writing. And within about three weeks, he had a serious accident at work. He was in a, now in a wheelchair. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, that's not what he was after. He's got plenty exactly. of time to write, but he's now having to use a wheelchair. So it's not what he wanted at all. Those are the things. It Sometimes it's being very careful of personal gain. Now you can say, well, I asked for personal gain with my neighbours disappearing. But I know... They were one side. I can't say they were, but the other two, one side with the parking and the one across the road, were annoying other people as well. It wasn't just me that was getting annoyed by this guy because the guy next door he had like there's only two of them had three cars, and there's only room for one space on the drive for one car, so he's parking his cars all over the place, you know. And it was actually annoying other people, so it wasn't just my personal benefit. But you know, if you want that kind of help, you have to be very specific. You say, Well, like a bit of peace and quiet to work on something, so I have the health and energy to work on that, so therefore you wouldn't get ill. Yes, <laughs> you find yes. another way. But <laughs> it, the, these things, it definitely absolutely has an influence on the world around us, but it's not 
mir miracle work, if you like. It, it is in yeah. accordance with ordinary reality. So if you're asking for like to personal wealth, you're not suddenly going to find a lump of gold bar on your, your doorstep, you know, or, or suddenly be mailed money from nowhere. But you might find a, a ten dollars in the street, that kind of thing. You might just sort of think, oh, look at that. Well. Having having been short on rent or a bill and been you know spent a whole day being like oh my god i could really use money right now i could really use money right now and finding some in your dryer when you're like wow where did that come from exactly it's little things and sometimes yeah. it's sideways influence yes almost yes yeah, so, yeah. so they, they can't or at least i don't know really of any case where they create something absolutely miraculous to occur spontaneous things appearing although again sometimes that does happen <clears throat> so excuse me particularly in john d here again i take john d at what he said as being truthful there's an, is scry edward kelly possibly might be a bit um devious mischievous but d himself was a man of honor and he does describe an occasion when a, a new crystal ball literally appeared in the room by itself out of nowhere. It was literally like see it forming and appearing, which is <clears throat> which is then found was a more effective crystal for the work they were doing. I have seen things appear from nowhere uh, many years ago in a, a group circle meditation. There was a there's probably about twenty of us. It was a big group, all sitting in a circle with a, a candle burning in the centre, and I remember seeing a little light beside it, sort of just appear for a little while, and speaking to others, others saw it as well. At the end of the session, there was a blue ball, about the size of a marble, beside the candle. It wasn't there when we started, no one rolled it into the middle, and it just sort of appeared. It, for no reason, it had no meaning, you know, it was no relevancy, it wasn't someone was asking for little blue balls to appear, but it appeared from nowhere. You know, that's the thing you experience is things like that sometimes happen and sometimes things get moved about as well, which you don't yep. really want is very irritating. I I that is something that happens constantly to me. Mm -hmm. Um that actually happened today with my boyfriend's wallet. Yeah. And oh, yeah. are you sure about that? I, <laughs> you yeah, just <laughs> and I just go, well, I it I had looked everywhere and I looked in the place that I found it and I looked there and five minutes later mm. looked everywhere else and went, okay, Pixies, give it back, please. And <laughs> went back and it was exactly where I'd looked already. And yeah. I was like, I appreciate it because you don't thank the Pixies. Mm. It'll make them mad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, funnily enough, I'm actually working on a new book at the moment. I'm actually working on two different books at the same time, as I always do. But this one is a compilation of very much the material I was talking about earlier, the, my earlier experiments with magic. I There is standard set crystal divination work you can do that's in various books. Trithemius was the author of one of the original ones that reappears in um, Francis Barrett's The Magus. But I've adapted my own version of that trying to cut back on this a lot of rigmarole about times and places and days and that kind of thing, which I thought, let's experiment in time. If I remove an element and see if it still works, then it's okay. So I've kind of pared it down a little bit. So I'm making, I'm writing the book based on my old notes, which I found fairly recently is what's really spurred me to do this. That and a combination of what I remember from the top of my head of what I used to work with. So I'm, as I'm writing that at the moment. That should be out fairly soon, probably in the summer. But, while I'm working on it, we've had all sorts of odd things happening in my house. The oddest one of all, which it sounds quite strange to tell the story, but it really did speak both my, myself and my wife. Is like, bloody hell, that is definitely, that's weird. We have um, a cat problem with our place. The um, small front lawn, one of the cat local cats is, likes to use it as a toilet occasionally. And, of course, it's a bit on the smelly side and have to remove it. It doesn't help when I've got clients visiting and there's been cat poo on our lawn. So we've put a little uh, water pistol. It's small, but it's quite powerful. And it, it does the links with the garden. And the idea is if you ever spot a cat, I'll give it a quick scoot at the water pistol. I mean, it doesn't hurt the cat. It runs off. It doesn't like it, which is fine. Now, the water pistol sits right next to the kitchen sink, which is by the window, which looks out to the lawn. It, it's always there. I hadn't noticed it wasn't there for a while. I hadn't noticed it wasn't there. Now, a wife had bought some flowers just for the house, and we got some vases. And they're on top of a cabinet the other side of the kitchen. And you have to get a stepladder. She can't reach them. She's only five foot. So you get a little ladder for myself to reach up. I mean, I'm six foot, and I still have to get the stepladder to reach up to get them. Pull one down. The water pistol was there. 
Now, there's no logical way it could have got there. My wife can't reach up there. Neither of us would have put it up there. There's no reason to put it up there. You know, we've actually got a cleaner. We ran the cleaner and said, did you move it? He didn't know what we were talking about. He definitely didn't move it. But it definitely moved. And it's like, how did that get up there? At the moment, <clears throat> in the evenings, we're sitting watching TV in our lounge and the, the kitchen's sort of just beside it. You can't see the kitchen from the lounge, but it's, it's pretty much just there. The sheer amount of noise that's coming out of there, clangs, bangs, things start being dropped or moved. You go out there, nothing's changed. But throughout the evening, while I'm working on that book, this stuff is happening again. It's like it's it's reignited something, definitely. Almost like my powers have returned <laughs> because I'm working on the old <laughs> material again. It's like it's all reconnected. But, yeah, it is really strange. I mean, just to give you a bit of background, this house was built in the 1990s. The, the, the whole estate was built in the 90s. There was nothing on this land before. There's no old buildings on this. I mean, there were some not far away, but this particular area, there's nothing. So it's not like it's a ghost. It's nothing to haunt it. And it's not we're not seeing apparitions. It's just objects. It's what you probably call poltergeist type activity. But that's quite common with people who work with magic. They have a poltergeist issue. And I think it's energy. It's residual energy that's kind of just left over that's causing things to happen. Yeah. It flits about. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the classic story I often tell, just quickly, of um, one client I had, I might have told you this one last time, but it connects to what we're talking about here, that obviously when you're a therapist, clients get upset. That's ex to be expected. In fact, it's positively encouraged. It's releasing emotion, cathartic effect. But I had this one guy years ago, whenever he got upset, my ceiling would crack, like a crack Ooh. noise. Quite definite sound. Now, the ceiling of this office is, there's no way up there. There's nothing up there at all. It's completely empty, empty void. But Every time the of the ceiling, and he came for months, and he was getting quite upset quite a lot. Not just once or twice. Every time he got upset, that ceiling cracked. It's like it's like a psychic discharge of energy from the emotion was exploding out. It was having a literal effect. So that was found absolutely fascinating. I know that sort of biologically, our hearts have an electrical field it gives out, which is about twenty feet. The brain gives on about six inches out of the head, but the heart one is about 20 feet. So if it's like a heart palpitation, it could be causing a crack in the ceiling. That would be more like a, a kind of quasi-scientific explanation for it. But whatever it was, emotional discharge was having that effect. Now, we know of countless cases, of particularly of teenage girls, having basically emotional issues as they're getting older and then associated paranormal activity, predominantly poltergeist activity. So the emotional trauma then manifesting as a real affect moving objects and that kind of thing he's kind of recognized there's a good correlation i mean you can't prove it obviously but there's a strong correlation between the two but certainly as i say those who are involved with more magical stuff will tell you regularly that the year you get particularly working in ritual stuff you get side effects if you like sort of tremors afterwards that are, are undeniably happening yeah yeah um I, one of our latest guests uh, Michael Hughes talked about whenever he would do ritual magic in the basement, the light would go out. Oh, yeah. For no reason. It just would do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every <laughs> time. <laughs> There's an electrical discharge that comes with that. No doubt about it. I'm so convinced of that. You are, the you work with energies that are very subtle, but, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a physical element to it, by the doubt, and that electrical discharge. I mean, it's, again, you've got the parallels with ghost investigations. You know, often paranormal activity happens, the equipment starts to go off on you, batteries drain out very quickly. So there, it's got to be parallel. There's no, not entirely separate. There's definitely parallels of these things going on along, which suggests there's one core experience behind all of it. There's kind of a core connection to these things, which connects things like the ritual stuff, which is, again is obviously specifically designed to, if you're working it way, to summon to create communication, whereas your ghost investigate, you're going on the hopes of getting communication. I mean, I'll be honest with you, when I used to work with a paranormal events company, we wouldn't be unusual for me to do a little ritual at the start just to try and engage the energies at the place to try and give it a, a push, if you like, to help things to move along a little bit. And often now, almost more for kind of entertainment because it gives them something to do if it's very quiet. Now, I take a crystal ball along. You know, a crystal ball with the proper accoutrements, all the, the um, table, the thing stands on this little disc that goes on top of that. Now, it's the proper stuff. I don't do all the preliminary ritual that goes with it other than the oration, which is a prayer you say at the start, which you get one of the guests to read out. And more often than not, they see things in the crystal. Now, whether it's 
pure imagination because they want the experience or they're genuinely seeing stuff. I don't know because I can't read their heads. But usually they see something. Most people start to see something in it, which means they've had an experience of some kind, which is something at least, you know. So that's quite a common thing I do with investigations is to have the, the, the equipment with me. As I say, particularly if it's a, a night and nothing's happening at all, at least they've got something they can take take away with them. So I mean, there's all sorts of crossovers. I mean, I probably, of course, know about the Hellier TV series that's been on a little while ago. They were obviously were doing ritual invocations to Pan in the cave. So there was this ritual summoning. The fact that they did it rather the wrong way around, and potentially those that know how Pan ritual were like, oh, no, don't do that. That's not good. <laughs> that was like you're asking something very mysterious and trickster to come in and do things for you. Like, that's not a good idea. But, you know, they tried it. You can give them credit. They had a go at it. But, you know, I wonder the way they did it, put it that way. So, but there is the crossover. You know, that's that's a positive sign. And that it's like it, back in the day, the idea of ghost investigations with a medium. We never did that. You bring mediums on ghost investigations. It wasn't really until Joker Cora and uh, Most Haunted started that the idea of using mediums became a thing. And I know for quite a while, there was a strong resistance in America to the idea of using mediums. It, they didn't like that idea. And then began to realize, actually, it does, it adds a little extra element to it. But Okora was the pioneer of doing that, definitely. I mean, mediums didn't want to do ghost investigations anymore. The ghost investigations were mediums along. But the realization that there was a crossover here, you know, if you're going to be a medium communicating with a with the audience's grandmother, then why not communicate with the being that might be occupying the haunted house you're in? It makes sense now, but it wasn't done for a long time. So the idea of the crossing over of magic into the realms of like paranormal investigating, again, it makes sense, but there is definitely resistance to the idea where the paranormal wanted to be seen as being scientific, then this magic stuff, that's not scientific. But hang on a minute, you're talking about investigating ghosts. You know, that before, you know that it's unscientific. Well, you're a ghost investigator. Come on, you know, we want to call it paranormal investigator, but it's still seen as the best pseudoscience. So, you know, let's be real here, but, you know. I was actually going to ask you about that um, because I am... I, I have also noticed that there's a there's a section of the para weird community that is like, no, witchcraft is not a thing, mm. ritualism is not a thing, don't do that, go away, UFOs are serious, and I'm yeah. always like, dude, mm. <laughs> I like I'm not trying to like mess with your views on the world and tell you you're wrong, but. How mm. is how is witchcraft mm -hmm. different than psi, or yeah. different than trying to meditate to see a UFO? Because I think I think there are so many different shades and variations of witchy things. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that a lot of them have gotten very accepted, at least in American popular culture. You know, meditation is now extremely common and popular. Ooh. And there's, so are, you know, using crystals for specific energy drawing capabilities. And, yeah. you know, all of this has become very popular, very accepted. Uh, you know, there are more and more occult bookstores popping up. We have a new one opening in Athens. I'm very excited. Excellent. <laughs> Um, you should have my books. <laughs> I, I actually might mention them and bring one by. The Wicked Shall Decay has been making the rounds of all of my witch friends um, here. Um, and I just, I've always, I've always wondered if types of magic use should be employed in parallel with scientific investigation of the para weird. Hmm. I don't see why not. Because, I mean, again, if you look at the idea about the, come back to the origins of where UFOs are coming from, it's seen as scientific to suggest they're from alien planets using technology we don't understand. And seen as weirdly wonderful to say there might be parallel realities that they exist with us here and that they manifest because they're here. You know, why was one seen as more scientifically i.e. believable than the other idea. The idea that, going back to what I said before, about the description of how these aliens appear, if they are looking the way they often describe, then they are from a planet very much like Earth. Why not be Earth? You know, they are of a, the right sort of size for our gravity. They often are seen as without any breathing apparatus. They're obviously able to breathe carbon, um, 
nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere, they're obviously not affected by the viruses that exist here because they don't have any kind of spacesuits they're wearing and they do have some kind of ability to defeat all viruses no matter what they might look like. Well, we know that's not an easy thing to do at all. It suggests that they probably are from here rather than from another planet. But yeah, as I say, that seems more of an extreme view that some people are laughing at the room if you say, oh, I don't think they're from other planets, I think they're from other realities around us. Oh, don't be daft, they're from planet blah, 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 whatever. You know, the fact that fundamental physics says these things can't get here fast as speed of light unless they are travelling through some system we have no vague comprehension of is like, well, that's okay, you know. We can't possibly explain the propulsion system, but yet they must be using it to get here well, no, if they're already bloody here, but they're not. They don't need it. If they're flipping realities, there are other ways of perhaps of doing that rather than moving through vast amounts of space at ridiculously high speeds. I think we've got so used to the idea of fast and light travel from things like Star Wars and Star Trek. It's like, it's, you know, it's blasé. Of course, you'll be able to travel fast at the speed of light. Well, if you start to really look into the physics of that, you realize how utterly impossible it is at the moment in terms of what we understand in terms of any kind of ship that uses a physical propulsion system, there's no way because of the basic E it was MC squared. It's completely real. It works, you know. The faster you want to go, the greater the mass becomes to the point that it's because it's squared, it gets the ridiculous figures to get close to the speed of light, much less get past that barrier. So they'll be using some kind of system of transport we have no conception of at the moment. Therefore, is it more possible that perhaps they're already here? not in terms of heroes in living amongst it like they live but existing in this reality <laughs> around us you know because again they're given that very much that human agenda of invasion and conquer that's a very human idea you know, why they wouldn't just be quietly living side by side and not be bothered to change anything around us maybe you know, if they're not fully physical existing at a different energy level maybe why not again only manifesting in ways that we can perceive and understand again why not that's why as i say the gray aliens is a fairly modern phenomenon before it was little green men you know when did they change color they obviously changed color at some point because they used to be green now they're gray you know it's that kind of thing i, I must have i've never really looked into it properly but one person did suggest if you look back to whitney streber's first book communion before that the idea of looking and appearing the way they do in communion has become the standard appearance, the grey skin, the, the uh, oh, yeah. oil eyes, that it originates with that book. If you go back to books before that, there's a much broader variety of alien being seen. That has become the predominant form. So it's interesting how the, the cultural phenomena affects us. Someone else pointed out a little while ago, which was absolutely fascinating, that these ufos the triangular ufo sighting started in the early 80s and that became a, a quite a common sighting what was the biggest film around in 1981 empire strikes back yeah the big triangular spaceships i was gonna you know. say with the, with exactly the star destroyer yeah, yeah i'm blanking <laughs> millennial here sorry <laughs> Fair enough. But now the idea of the cultural phenomenon of something like Star Wars, with Star Wars itself in 77, 78, and then then Empire Strikes by 81, was enormous, you know, massive. So it's entered the psyche, this idea of maybe UFOs change shape in accordance with the cinema, what was being seen on the screen. Again, they say it was, it was a cultural reference, it was a cultural do, um, documentary I was watching, it wasn't to do with paranormal at all, but they were pointing out the way in which the popular culture seeps into the consciousness. He said this thing about the, the triangular spaceships being see so UFOs and Star Wars. And I thought, bloody hell, yeah, he's onto something here. There is that kind of parallel between the change of perceptions. But again, as I say, saying, you, know, you go back to sort of Victorian times, you didn't, there were no grey alien descriptions, nothing like that. You had the pixies, you had um, elves, you had trolls, all those kind of small underworld creatures were the predominant thing people described. I mean, there are examples, which I may have mentioned before, of very old phenomena that kind of fits in with the more ufo -y description two cases i found in the isle of sky in the 1800s one case a woman was seen with gray skin who appeared to be talking without moving her mouth speaking an unknown language several people saw her and she then disappeared there was another description of some fishermen i'm oh, sorry fishermen uh, going out to fish who saw two young boys dressed in gray clothing appear to teleport a cow off a cliff and then back on again, and then disappeared. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Another okay. 
yeah, <laughs> early was, cattle mutilation messing yeah, around. Exactly. So what is that all about? But, but the fairies stole cows too. Yes, yeah, exactly. It fits in with all that kind of idea. You know, it does fit in. And um, one I thought was quite fascinating, well, again, was a, a different group of fishermen who would they go out for fishing four or five days at a time. And they said on the first day out, this bird landed on the top of the mast, stood on it, was about five to six feet tall, looking down with red eyes, stood there for four or five days before it vanished. And I think a winged creature, tall, red eyes, what does that sound like? A mothman. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, wow. But these are in the 1800s. All these reports in the 1800s, these are happening. So it's like, what the hell are these things? You know, they don't fit with any sort of understood description of creatures of those times. And I said the grey skin was an interesting phenomenon. But again, it's like the one with women described having grey skin, which could be very pale. The boys are super wearing grey clothing. Well, just grey clothing. It's just clothing. It's not that they were supposed to be in grey. So the ideas kind of float about and kind of come in and out of vogue almost. Well, you know, before before Whitley Strieber, there there were aliens similar to that. Um, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted by, see, they had big heads and they had what Barney Hill described as wraparound eyes, large, right, yeah, very dark wraparound eyes. So you can kind of say that's a gray mm -hmm. sort of, but I don't remember them being described as gray skinned. I remember them as being pale. Yes. Um, yeah. and then Betty Andreessen it was sort of like the Greys, but then um, Antonio Villaboas down in South America, they were not the Greys at all. Mm. That was, they had big eyes though. They had very mm. large almond shaped black eyes and the female that he had sex with was very pale and very petite with those big eyes with a pointed chin and then very wispy blonde hair. So that doesn't really, to me, sound like a gray at mm. all. Also, the interesting idea of having had sex with an alien, the, so they have evolved very similar sex organs to us. Again, yes. that seems a bit unlikely. <laughs> yes, yes. And that doesn't, and, and she very she very much made the, made it clear to him that she was trying to get pregnant. She patted her belly and then pointed up to the sky. So she was from the sky and she was going to take his baby back. You know, to we, the sky. We and I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can't produce offspring of other creatures on this planet other than other no. humans. Nope. <laughs> you know, even the most closest genetic chimpanzees, we can't actually reproduce with them. There's been experiments, exactly. But it can't happen. It won't work. So how do you expect you can do that with a creature from another planet? It's, it's Star Wars time. It's Star Trek. It's pure Star Trek. But yeah, I don't Well, know. And, and even Star Trek, you know, they explain how they did Spock. It was not by any natural means. They had to play Gene Splicey, mm. you know. Yeah things with that and it was some big deal and then it was in vitro fertilization and all that so mm -hmm. and the yeah. only reason the romulans and the vulcans can breed is because they're the same species yes, absolutely yeah yeah in, exactly they were left long before didn't they? the idea of imposition of the logic they didn't like the idea i knew too much about star trek this is terrible. I, it's okay i do too <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause of course laughs> which I, I want to know if we get triangle ufos from Star Wars, what, when are we going to get an Enterprise? Well, maybe you have a saucer, saucer section. That's true. Saucer <laughs> section is we, yeah, that's true. We've only seen the detached saucer yeah, section. That makes sense. Perhaps it is. But I mean, even Star Trek attempted to explain why we all look similar, didn't they? Because they had the whole idea of some alien race millions of years ago implanted yeah. this DNA structure, didn't they? That then this yep. the, the seeding, universe. yeah, the seeded exactly. the galaxy, the, the yeah. makers to explain it that way. But you know, I just find. I keep them at the same point. I know the idea that they look so similar to us, it's just, it's far more points to the idea that they're from here than from some alien realm. I mean, that makes much more sense to me now. Again, I wouldn't have said that long, long ago, but certainly reading people like John Keel, of course, and Jacques Vallée, it makes sense to say they're from here rather than elsewhere. And that again, if they're not fuzzy, fully physical forms before us, try to say that when you're drunk, then <laughs> the idea that they are sort of linking with 
magical entities as well, those those kind of things, then yeah, it's certainly possible that, that they are essentially the same thing. Yeah. I need to yeah, I, 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 I think I think it makes sense. Um, so when you're one of the things I find interesting and, and since we've gone far afield, we'll just keep going, um, is when contactees and abductees talk about the messages they get from the aliens and I'm going to call them aliens because everybody calls them aliens, but I don't necessarily think they're alien, but whatever. Yeah. Um, those messages are often things about our own planet. That's another thing that I find interesting is, you know, there's always the the message, well, you need to not blow the planet up. Um, nuclear weapons are bad. Uh, you're messing up your ecosystem, you know, all of these things, all of these messages keep coming. It's been happening since the, the 1950s. Mm. It's this whole series of, it's like a broken record almost Yeah, that we have these, well, that makes more sense if it's their ecosystem we're screwing up too. Yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting to think that a lot of biblical descriptions of angels visiting with those sorts of messages as well come with warnings of possible dangers if you do, if you do whatever you're doing. There's examples in the Bible of alien, of um, angels doing that. So again, it's a kind of parallel. In right. That. Yeah, certainly the idea that if they are in some form sharing our reality, our world, uh, then if they could do things that can sort of knock holes between realities, then maybe that's what is actually happening. That's part of the warning process of saying, be careful. It reminds me of if you've seen the third season of Twin Peaks, with the episode eight of that, where you've got basically, well, that's exactly what they're saying. The first atomic bomb tests ripped a hole in reality and allowed um, entities to come through, like Bob to come through. That that's where they've come from. So maybe that's why there is a, often a, a focus on nuclear power and nuclear installations because of the potential damage it's doing, not just at the physical level, but at the quantum level as well, that kind of disruption is happening there. Because that's when it gets interesting. You talk about quantum physics, the idea of things like quantum tunneling, that the things can move through solid objects, the idea of um, the, oh, it's called now, the two things far apart that affect each other at the same time, if one affects the other. Look, he, quantum entanglement. Yeah, yeah quantum entanglement. Yeah, all those kind of elements that to to the action at a distance is the other. That's exactly what Einstein called right. it because it just even for Einstein it just didn't make sense. He didn't want to kind of deal with that stuff because our understanding of conventional physics falls apart at that level and goes down to quantum level. And again, that might be the answer about sort of fast and light travel. Going back to that idea, but again, it makes more sense that they use quantum tunneling to move from one reality to another one. That they are moving across, or that they are less than physic, less than fully physical until they want to be seen, but they're still here. So there's something affecting radiation affecting them. It's going to have an effect at that level as well. Again, it's just speculating, but it, to me, again, it makes more sense. Why would they be bothered about what we're doing to this planet if they're from a thousand light years away? Why would they care? Well, you know, the contactees, the Venusians. Or, you know, the, the ones who were talking to Adamski always said things like, well, if you blow up your world, then it messes with the balance. It destroys the balance of the universe. It, it, it always sounded kind of made up to me, but <laughs> um, it, it does say in a way, well, if you mess up your world, you're going to mess our world up, too, without saying, if you mess up your world, we live here, too. So don't do that because we'd like to live here. Yeah. What's wrong with you? You know, <laughs> yeah. why are you doing this humans? Why, why yeah. are you doing this? So to me, again, that makes more sense. You know, the idea of Dempsey saying that one planet damage affects another one. I think that forgets the scale of the universe, the scale of space, how far away things are. We talk about, for example, the nearest sun to us is just over four light years away. Four light years doesn't sound very much, but, but that's, it is that's the, <laughs> exactly the distance light travels in a year. You know, the sun is 96,000, sun six million miles away, that's eight seconds. 
So you imagine how far a year is, you know, much less four years. It's a vast scale of these things. The idea that if Earth suddenly blew up tomorrow, that it'd have any effect on anything other than our own solar system is nonsense. Of course it won't. It's far too far away. It's like saying a, if you blow a grain of sand off of a beach in California, a beach in Florida is affected. Well, yeah. yeah, okay, you talk about the butterfly effect of chaos theory, but yeah, at least don't make a damn bit of difference, is it really? But that's what we're talking about it. With those scales of distance, it means nothing. But, you know, the earlier thinking of not getting the sheer scale and size of space, then that, that, that gets missed. But again, if you're talking about this realm around us now, this reality, if you like, this physical existence or whatever level of it, but it's here, then of course they're going to be concerned if you're screwing things up. Yeah, exactly. And I don't blame them for not just coming right out and saying, hey, we're your neighbors. Please stop, like, trashing the whole neighborhood because humans, there's a reason I think that we we frame aliens as conquerors because we're conquerors. We're dicks. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if... We knew for a fact that there was a race of invis of invisible beings that could do whatever they wanted and appear and disappear at will. We would all freak out mm. and oh, yeah. try and fight them <laughs> or catch yeah. them or experiment on them. Boring all that. of the above. Yeah, pretty much all at once, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it hits that more important point as well, the fact that by nature we are territorial. You know, we're, by nature, we're competitive because we want to survive. So anything that we don't understand, we tend to be negative towards. You know, anything that sort of threatens our current situation, we tend to have a negative response towards. So they might think, well, I'm not going to come out and show we're here because you're probably going to attack me. But also, if you think of it this way, we might think, well, obviously, if you're here, you'll come out and say hello. But that's our thinking. That's our way of seeing yeah. the world. They might not have any desire to do that whatsoever. I mean, it's an often quoted fact that the dolphins are incredibly intelligent creatures, but they don't build anything. But why would they want to? They've got what they need. You know, they're happy swimming in the ocean mm -hmm. with a great intelligence. It doesn't matter to them. They're not. They don't have the thumb, obviously, to be able to build things. But it's not something that they're interested in doing. If you ha exist as a being, as the ability to move between realms and realities, then why the hell would you want to say hello? I'm here. You know, it, it might not be the way you'd even want to exist. You have no interest in acting that way. We, it's because we tend to humanify, and not even a word, but you know what I mean? we try to see it through the human lens of how these things are supposed to. Yes, thank you. That's the word I was trying to remember. But you, we have to see these things through a human lens all the time. You know, this is how I would respond. Then why don't you respond that way? Well, we know fellow human beings don't respond the same way as us. You know, given the, the same data, they'll do something different. And that's a human being. So why anything other that's, that's not human would respond the same way we would? Well, of course, they're probably not going to. They don't have to see it as a threat. They're not again. If they have no desire to change anything, or they can change whatever, like at will, again, they're not going to bother telling us they're here. Because why would they? That I would. I, I wouldn't mean, bother. This is why aliens aren't going to mess with us. I wouldn't mess with us. We're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we are a scary race and species. Mm. We survive in every climactic zone on our planet. We eat every plants. We eat plants that have damaging mm -hmm. components on purpose mm -hmm. because we think they're fun and yeah. we like how they taste. Like we eat capsaicin for fun. Yeah. This is not normal behavior. Your people eat and fish that are absolutely deadly if not done completely perfectly correctly. You don't exactly. know they've been done and they can die yeah. from it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We, fish, scorpion fish. We have a frightening amount of physical endurance. I mean, that's how we originally hunted. We would run things to death. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like we're like we're I saw this meme, but like we're essentially the predator. Oh yeah, yeah. We in are. a lot of ways, like we we are scary. We would be we'll scary. Have that cloaking technology, right? Mm. I wouldn't want to rumble with humans if I was an alien. We are both primitive and really, really, really intense. Yeah. Well, the other <laughs> way you could look at it is they could see us as we would see maybe ants or other yeah. smaller animals that they're not a threat to us. They're not an issue. We're not, you know, why would I want to reveal myself to a bunch of ants living in my garden? <laughs> why would I want to go and talk to them for God's sake? Why would I bother? You know, they're not a threat to me. I'm not going to bother doing anything to them because they're just there and we're there. 
we're here. Yeah. So, you know, there could be that kind of level of, they don't bother, not because they're, I mean, they're more advanced, but because they're not like us. They have no reason to want to connect to directly yeah. unless we see them. I mean, it's a classic line, I know, from the uh, Moth and Prophecies film where um, Alexander Leake is saying that basically what happened was he saw them and they saw that he saw him. And that there was this kind of like, we're here, we're just minding our own business, but now you know we're here, we're going to keep an eye on you because you know we're here. Not because you're going to think of the information, just the fact that you know I'm here, therefore I'm going to keep an eye on you. Not so not that you're going to do anything with the fact you know I'm here, but I've noticed that you've noticed me, therefore I'm going to keep an eye on you. And I think there's a lot of truth to that because I think there are plenty of people who have seen something and then have strange things happen to them their whole life. Yes. There are also plenty of people who see one thing and one thing only. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the people who see one thing and one thing only, they saw it and it didn't notice them versus the people who have repeated strange encounters if they've been the noticed ones. Yeah. Very possibly that could be the fact that they have registered the fact you've registered them, therefore you're going to see more. The, the classic example I often talk about is people go on ghost investigations regularly. Most of them start to see and experience more the more they do these things. I mean, I used to, I probably mentioned before, I used to work for a paranormal events company back in, well, God, bloody hell, I think 20 years ago now. But I was out most weekends with the company and you get a lot of regular faces and they say exactly that. I'll come along for the fun of it, but I'd never see the thing. Give them a year or so of a dozen or so events. Thinking, yeah, I saw that. And that was happening to me as well. It opens you up to this stuff. And I think that's mm-hmm. once that door in your mind has been open, okay, so it was quite familiar, but once that door in your mind has been opened, you can't close it. It's open now. These things are going to come walking through that door and explore and see what's going on. Some people definitely do have the one experience that they remember. And I often wonder if you have one experience you remembered that, but others have happened that maybe you've not noticed. I mean, a classic example again with the ghost thing is, you know, most people expect a ghost to be in these sort of dark and old haunted houses, but you could be passing something that no one else sees that is actually part of the place you're in, in the middle of the afternoon. You know, I mean, my, again, I'm probably talking this last time, but my very first ghostly experience was that a sunny summer's afternoon and you know, it wasn't some sort of dark, stormy night or anything. It was the middle of an afternoon in a local uh, park where there's an old um, fort which was built in the Napoleonic times, the 1800s. So it's not like a, a castle fort, but it's a, a fort that was then built up in the First World War and then more in the Second World War. And it was derelict-ish, as in it was all fenced off and there was no one using the place. But there were big gaps in the fence. So you could get inside easy. And there was a large courtyard. And kids like myself was like, nine or ten at the time, would go into this courtyard and sort of play football, um, English soccer, and just muck about in there. And I know, again, saying before, but remember stuff very clearly when it happens, this happens, I say, good God, over 40 years ago now, but I can still remember like it was yesterday. Just being there, looking up, seeing two men walk past in a military uniform, which I later found out was World War One uniform, walk past me about 10, 15 feet maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe 20 feet, but certainly close by. No sound, but walking past, looking down and thinking, but what the bloody hell was that? Look back and they were gone. Uh, but they'd walked towards an area where there was just a wall. There was no where they could have, goosebumps talking about it again. <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, they were as real as anything. And the solid figures, they had uh, like a bandaging around the lower halves of their legs below the knee. And that is a World War I uniform. And they were dressed up like that. Now, again, this place was built in the Napoleonic times. It was used in the First World War as a lookout for Zeppelins used to fly over. So there would have been men stationed there very genuinely. I mean, they weren't being shot at or anything like that or trying to kill each other. They were just walking along. And I probably saw them no more than maybe four or five seconds, but they were there. They were real, as far as I was concerned. Absolutely, you know, I see them without registering in my mind what the hell I was seeing. I was just seeing two men. I thought, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Looking back, they were gone. But they were real. You know, they were definitely there. And that say, it was a sunny afternoon. So the idea of having that one experience because you may be on a ghost investigation or it's the middle of the night and you hear strange things, but you might be seeing stuff in the daytime and not realize. But it was a as we were talking before, you might be going a bit mad. <laughs> you might be imagining it or might not be there at all. But, you know, who's to know? It's a difficult one. It is that grey area, as I was saying earlier on, that you can't be sure which is real, which is imagination, and which is losing the plot, you know? So you have to be careful there. But as I say, with my particular site in that day, it fitted with what I found out about the place. I mean, as a nine, ten-year-old kid, I knew very little about this, this fault other than it was there. 
it was later research that revealed how old it was and the fact that it, what they were wearing fitted with World War One. It was stuff I found out later after the experience. You know, it was just one of those strange things. They were just there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Residual replay of an old event is how it would be described. But again, it could be looking back in time. It could be a window in time that suddenly opened up. Who's to say? Yeah. You, know? you never know. But there are times when those kind of things happen and you just observe residual. And sometimes you have things that happen where these things seem to know you're seeing them, respond to you. In fact, there's a story I probably did tell this one last time, so I apologize if I saw this one again, but it was absolutely fascinating experience of a friend of mine had working in the uh, a library in london i think it was the freemason library but it was a it was an old library he was there doing some research sitting at a desk and seemingly from nowhere this man appeared in very old-fashioned clothing looked at my friend in surprise to see him sitting there my friend looked at this bloke in surprise to see him standing there and the guy walked off and disappeared but yeah. they clearly saw each other this guy was dressed in probably Victorian or Edwardian clothing because the library's been there since the 1700s, I think. It was old, certainly old enough. But they saw each other. You know, this guy, it would be, to find a diary of this guy sitting there, saw this ma man sitting at a desk in his very strange clothing would be brilliant, but of course never have. <laughs> but, you know, he said that this guy clearly saw me and was surprised to see me, as surprised as I was to see him. It was fascinating. That has um, to be a, a, a little portal in time. It's got to be. There's no other explanation. Little either. window. It doesn't even fit as if it was a through. ghost. It was, there was something happened there. There was some kind of mental connection. Now, they may not have physically seen each other. It could be that they see each other in the mind. That mental connection over time was actually what happened. And that's what they experienced. You know, it, again, there's just no way of knowing. We come to certain conclusions based upon less than complete evidence or less less than complete theory as to what this experience is. So it goes back to this idea, we're always assuming the UFOs must be nuts and bolts spaceships from other planets. And it's like, that's just a possibility. But as often, many people see that is the only possibility, which is a shame. So talking about um, you might be going mad, and also, you know, messages received from non-human intelligences, I always think about Joan of Arc. Because if she was crazy, she was really effective at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she was, she if, was very functional. Yes. Oh, yeah. For yeah. a crazy person. Because that, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I am mentally ill. And I, in a time before therapy and medication, I could not have had a psychotic break and then led an army successfully to free my country. Like, I just, I'm not, I would not have been able to do that. <laughs> I don't know anybody who would have been able to do that. Well, um, actually I do. There's someone okay. who functions schizophrenic, that he has schizophrenia. He's on strong medication. As long as he takes it, he can, he's fine. If he doesn't take it, he does hear voices and he knows they're not from anywhere else other than his head, but he can't not have them telling him what to do. Right. As okay. If somebody else telling him. So he, I, she could have just been really functional. I All think. Right. I mean, that, funny enough, it's something I read a little while ago. That's a long while ago now. It was about this kind of idea of functioning psycho psychoses, as a, in a broader sense of it. That the, the, there was an actual a diagnosis was given for what she probably actually had given or what was described that she was experiencing. There's actually a diagnosis for it. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but yeah, it is entirely possible that as long as you are. It depends on the level of effect, obviously. I mean, if you're totally convinced these voices are real and you have to obey them no matter what, then, you know, you're not going to function. But let's say this chap I know, he can function with that medication because he knows the voices are not a real person, but he'll see as if it's someone's talking to him. He gets that right. real sense of someone talking to him. But it becomes a kind of a splitting effect. I mean, don't get too much about his business because he's a friend. But there's a psycho psychotic splitting happening. Part of his mind believes it's genuinely a real person giving him orders he has to obey. The other part is a little... It's just strong enough to say, "Hang on a minute, no, this is not quite right. This is this is this is a del delusion again. I could stop this." With the medication he's on, then he says it still happens. It doesn't stop, but it's nothing like as powerful. I can literally tell them to shut them, shut the f up and go away. <laughs> they go away. They leave them alone. With that medication, they tend to not go away and leave them. Right. Alone. 
So it is certainly possible, because I say I do know someone who has been diagnosed, he was diagnosed over 30 years ago, and he's been dealing with, he went through some difficult times because he was given all sorts of medication that had no effect or even made him feel worse. He's been on and off, he's been out of mental institutions a few times, but I haven't seen him for quite a while, actually. But the last time I spoke to him was probably before the pandemic, of course, you know, his contact period because of the pandemic. But he's had no real difficulty. He's signed off permanently from work now. He doesn't have to work because he, the troubles he's been through. But, yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's good. And if it's – um, there's actually two people that this might fit. And the one who may listen to this, it's not him. So if you're listening, it's not you I'm talking about – I'll leave it at that. It's somebody else that I know. That he's not. The, he's not you. So don't worry. There is one person you might think I'm talking about. Them, I'm not. So, <laughs> right. That might sound vague to you guys, everybody else. But the one person it's addressing will understand entirely. <laughs> <laughs> it's not him. But yeah, so, I do. I do think about all the people throughout history who've heard voices or been contacted by something that, quite frequently has been referred to as God and then they've gone forth and, and done things. and changed the course of history. Mm, yeah. And is that another, I always ask myself, is that another function of, you know, non-human intelligence or is that a function of people just listening to their subconscious really, really well and deciding to do something about the world? With ceremonial magic, what you're deliberately engaging with something, you're deliberately bringing it into it. Doesn't pop out of the blue to communicate with you. You know, the, the one exception to that is what's called your guardian angel, which always sounds a bit kind of hairy fairy. But you do work with a, a higher guiding spirit, if you like. That's one that may pop in and communicate with you unexpectedly. But generally speaking, that's the only one that tends to. Again, it's one of those difficult areas because. Obviously, some medical schools I thought will tell you that all of this is just signs of men, men, mental instability. This whole belief that you're communicating with anything is just sign you're, you're losing it. You know, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been doing it for 20 years nearly. I don't subscribe to that thinking at all. I do think the stuff genuinely occurs, but unfortunately, a lot of the time it do get mixed up. And you know, as we were saying back at the beginning, there is that tendency to dismiss the idea of mental illness straight away as being a reason why someone is having X experience where she shouldn't be. It should be taken very seriously because you could be doing a disservice to that person who may have a serious condition and you're exacerbated by going along with what they're saying. You can actually make things worse for them. So that's something that we have to be cautious of. But when you strip all that back, there is definitely something going on there possibility of a collective unconscious that that information is coming from there therefore it is someone outside of you specifically but not you as in the great broad spectrum of all people that communication is coming from there but yeah i mean what better way to rally your troops or rally people to your cause say you was god inspired you know that's pretty right. powerful so people are going to go along because of that reason whether it's really because they genuinely believe it as god or they've used that as a convenient excuse to do what they want to do you know you can argue because we we know of people who, who do bloody awful things in the name of god you know um what's his name it's guy i forget his name now yeah? when it gave one to kill themselves with the cyanide laced um kool-aid oh um, jim jones jim jones, jim jones. yeah Again, that was supposed to be for good. David Koresh, that was all in the name of God, all that kind of thing. And then people died. You know, so using God as your reason or do you believe you'll be communicated to by God? Again, how often do you hear about killers who start claiming they heard voices that Satan told them to do all the killings? It's convenient because you get a diagnosis of you know, unable to um, stand trial through insanity, that kind of thing. You get, a, you get an easier time than if you're just convicted, convicted as a murderer. So people tend to go for that kind of plea. They can even get off, you know, with that kind of plea. So, of course, they're going to push in that general direction. But it's because they say Satan inspired them to do it. Doesn't mean to say he did. He's just they're using the reason. Even if they might genuinely believe Satan, like Son of Sam, believes Satan Satan to do what he was doing. But again, the diagnosis quickly shows there is mental illness there. So, you know, that's, that's, it is a difficult gray area. And I can understand why some people in the psychological profession would dismiss as all as being cranks and loonies for believing any of this stuff, because that's their way of dealing with this. It's not a bad way of dealing with things. It's just not, 
I think I would rather believe someone who is lying and accidentally believe them than disbelieve someone who's telling the truth. Mm. Because sometimes, and, and that, that's, that leaves out the gray area of mental illness altogether. Yeah. But when you look at it from a mentally ill standpoint, I'd still rather listen and maybe not believe necessarily, but listen empathetically mm-hmm. and and understand that this is someone's reality, whether that is a real reality uh, or a delusion mm-hmm. is is generally not up to me. But if it's starting to sound delusional, yeah, I'll maybe saying they should maybe seek yeah. somebody else to talk with is a I, good thing. I think it's it's, a, it's the consequences of what they believe. You know, if they are having messianic visions, but they're not harming anybody, they're not causing disruption or making anyone's life difficult or risking themselves, endangering themselves, then fine. Do that. You know, don't necessarily have a problem. It's if it is having a negative effect upon themselves or others around them, then the help is probably better sought. And um, there are cases where there's no obvious explanation as to why someone's behaving the way they're behaving, but yet they are. You know, you can't always trace it down to things like brain activity. Sometimes things happen, and you know, the way I work psychotherapeutically, I don't necessarily assume it's any kind of brain condition that's causing these things. Is often experience based. It's how someone's dealt with their experiences. But if it's if it helps them to deal with what's happened to them, I won't break down or try and dismiss or get rid of what they believe as the explanation for their experiences. As a good example, this was a guy that that trained me actually told me of a case he worked with many years ago where a guy basically had built this dream idea of a past life where he had been a young Greek boy in a village in ancient Greece and the war was on. I don't know which particular war it was, but the army were based in his town for the night and he was presented to the general for the night for pleasure. And it was his way of dealing with the fact he'd been abused by his uncle. But he turned it into this mythological version, which to the village of ancient Greece, it would be an honor to be sort of spend the night with the general, the, the, this important man, and what happened in the room was absolutely fine. So it was his way of dealing with his experiences to believe it was some kind of past life that was linked to that that was what was happening. Fine, you know, if that's how he wants to deal with it, then that's up to him. If it's negatively impacted them we work on it but he said that there's not what you can do there this worked for this guy to believe this is what actually happened to him that's what he preferred to have his belief and it was more comfortable with that for him rather than do with the horror of what actually had happened fine you know it doesn't have to be a problem makes sense it's akin to when someone is suffering from dementia and they mistake you for someone else. Mm. Don't argue. Yeah. Just yeah. be that other person. Yeah. That's fine. You know, the, yeah. I, I had a, a great aunt who at the end of her life thought I was one of her brothers. And one of my cousins was like, but you're not a boy. I'm like, so what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not I have short hair. Part. Yeah. And, and I've got a vest zipped up so she can't see that I have boobs. So. Yeah. So what? I'm one of her brothers. I don't the long she not have a go at you for being a brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. She's giving go at you for being that you've done something to them. Oh, that's not so good. But yeah, yeah. Oh, I agree entirely. Yeah, no. It's not hurting them to, it would hurt more to tell, to correct them than it is to, yes. to, to continue yes. with a slight delusion there. But certainly, yeah. Yes. I, I think that's, that's a good way to look at it. British therapy sounds so much nicer <laughs> and more gentle. <laughs> than some of the way we handle things in America. Well, we're lucky that there's therapy here. Let's just put it that way. Hmm. Uh, Because there's a strain of it here where it's like, well, you have to face reality. Yes. Like you have to face everything all the time. It, again, it is it's dependent upon what is actually going to help the, the client. We're getting to work a therapy now, but it is dependent on what helps the client themselves 
you, your aim is for them to feel better about themselves, to feel better about their life and the world they're in. In order to, I mean, what you can do really is you help them understand what they've experienced. What they do with that experience is more down to them than you, really. And if you help them understand that those things that happened to them wasn't their fault, which is often the common the case when a negative thing happens to someone, we often think it's our fault. Somehow we've caused these things to happen to us, and often it's nothing of the kind, you know. It's just that's the experience that's happened. It's letting go of those negative experiences or reframing what's happened into a way in which they're less negatively impactful upon your life. You know, if you've had a bad experience and you keep reliving it all the time, that's not doing any favours. You're trying to find a way of moving through the experience and moving beyond it, not letting go of it in the sense of forgetting it ever happened or saying it means less than it did. If it was huge and had a massive impact, it still had that impact, but you don't have to relive the impact all the time. That's what I do with people to help them psychotherapeutically to be able to move on from those experiences. I think that's a, that's, that's should be the aim of all therapy, I think, but some people have different theories. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it, we kind of got way off track, but <laughs> essentially we were talking about communicating with the other through various means. And therapy is kind of like communicating with, you know, if we're talking about a subconscious Yes. mind or something that is not remembered consciously then yeah it is it is still we're still sort of in the topic uh, i bit. think we stayed within it really but all the time to think about we it. did about communication we did. ultimately aren't we <clears throat> yeah. yeah and and communication with you know sometimes it may not be the other you know mm. i've thought for a while what if we are indeed the other mm. What if what we're talking with are disembodied humans? What if we are talking with the soul of Gaia, mm -hmm. you know, the, the world itself? What if it's the world itself saying, hey, would you quit with the ecological destruction? It's really yeah. messing with me. And, you know, well, lots of creatures are going to die, including you. So you might want to stop. Yeah, the, the whole um, is part of it. But you can also you think know. about the idea that these things aren't separate. You know, I think yeah. the underlying thing I've been trying to say is that you know, the idea of the us and them, the subject-object relation, doesn't actually work. It's the way in which you perceive things as an us and them, as a subject-object, as in you're a subject looking at the object of the world around you. But when, you can also say you're the, you're the subject of yourself and you're the object of yourself because you're the physical being, your object, and your subject is that mind that's whirring inside. But that's uh, it's the way our language works that creates that division as if it's an, a cast iron concrete division between the two, the subject-object relation. I'm getting the philosophy now. But yeah, it, it is the way our language works. It creates that division that may not actually exist. Those others are not us. And we are not them, but we're not separate from them. E they're not the same thing at the same either. There's like a third position where they are kind of blurring of the two. There's no definite difference. And it could be that you know all these things are perhaps no longer no longer embodied humans. The the consciousness itself has survived and is existing at a higher frequency. Oh, I hate that kind of language, but mm -hmm. the non fully physical realm, you know, not the realm of Malkuth using the Kabbalah as an example. They're they're above that, but they're still in this realm of existence. They are still here. But not as nuts and bolts here as we are living beings now. You now there is that whole fascination of what the hell the, the mind is anyway. It's not the brain, because there's brain does one thing and the mind can do something different the brain rewires itself and the mind acts differently but then is that just rewiring the computer but there's a, the program that's running the computer is the mind you know that's it's there's, again it's not got an absolute answer to it no one could say for definitively what the hell the mind is it's just a sum of the brain activity or is there more to it than that and if there is more to it than that and i think there is that could be the otherness is the extra part as well. That is the thing that's transpersonal, if you like. That's what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. Our consciousnesses are all connected. Mm. Or we're all part of a larger consciousness. Well, I mean, I absolutely know. think totally, definitely the collective unconscious, the Jungian sense of it is it's absolutely real. 
You know, you've only got to look at the way in which he, the ideas that he used to formulate the concept, the collective unconscious, the things that connect us. I mean, the, the thing that he found was fascinating was fairy tales and stories, as we were talking about earlier on, you know, that you'd find variations of the same themes of fairy stories in different cultures around the world who had no connection whatsoever. There's no way they could have connected to each other, but yet they had similar themes were appearing, similar um, concepts are found there. There's something there deeper within the whole idea of the archetypes, these concepts of these archetypal forms of beings, which is a kind of a almost like a platonic sense of the archetypal being of something, which again is shared across different cultures. You have no connections to each other. We have this mother concept, you have the father concept, an idealized version that we all have within us. And what again often we find in therapy is that the, the mum isn't the mother comps the archetype it's, they're so far apart that they have problems trying to deal with the mum person who's got all sorts of things going wrong with the mother ideal but they're trying to please or with the mother ideal all the time so they end up doing that you get people who don't have great fa fathers who end up marrying men older than them because they're finding that father figure but it's the father archetype they're striving to connect with they seem to exist within us and I mean, freud out not um so jung outlined some but he actually said there could be thousands of them thousands of different archetypes that are linking us together that we have a shared conception of these things i mean his explanation of flying saucers is particularly fascinating they seeing objects in the sky it's a cultural phenomenon it's an expression of our state at the moment we're looking for something else beyond us to try and solve our difficulties and problems you think actually that makes perfect sense when you see what these aliens come down and say you know stop mucking up the planet that kind of thing that's exactly what he's talking about that sense of there being those things so again it that connectedness is so important they often give the example, it's like the illusion of a thousand islands. You look out, you're on one island, looking out hundreds of islands around you in the sea, looking at their discrete individual islands. Until you take the ocean out of the way, they're all connected to the, the, the underneath, and they're all part of the same one land mass. That's what humans are. We are those islands that have the illusion of disconnection with just the water between them, which you can say is the air or whatever, but underneath at the lowest level, they're all connected, and that's, that's the idea. So you, the idea of the others are part of, they're just islands we, we can't see so well. They're still their own islands that are still connected together. But we can't see those islands because they're maybe past the curvature of the horizon. They're further away, but they're still part of that same one ocean bed that connects us all. Even the most unusual others can still be those separate islands that are further away. I think that's a great metaphor. I like that. It is a good metaphor. You're welcome to use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've uh, we've we've been talking for for a while now, hmm. and I, I think did we cover everything, Morgana? Is there anything more else? or less you want to ask? I... You're good. Yeah. Okay. Well, Andy, tell us what you're up to before we go. Sure. Tell us. Tell us your <laughs> projects. Tell us <laughs> where we can find you. Well, at the moment, as I say, the, the next book I'm working on is this one that's the collection of my own early experiences working with magic. My um, The second edition of Libra Coronzon, which is my book on Anokia Magic, I'm working on that. That's going to be with Three Hands Press, who published the Wikishow Decay at some point later, well, hopefully this year. But who knows where <laughs> things are going at the moment? Things seem taking forever. Um, <clears throat> my book on the runes has been republished, second edition, with um, Troy Press, or Troy Books, rather, which is available. Um, what else am I doing? I've got a project which I've been working on, which is nearly ready to start to launch, which is a YouTube channel in which I do short analysis of ghost videos I've found online. Um, they're, they're quite popular, these ones. You get these like top five ghost videos, and they're usually about 15, 20 minutes long. They have basically just replay a bit of footage and talk about it a little bit and then kind of move on. But I want to do a little bit more detail, a bit more of an examination. I never say whether I think they're real or they're not, but I, I you know, give you sort of slow motion replays of focused in, change the lighting so you get a better idea of what's going on. I've got about 
15, 16, they're ready to launch. They're only about 10 minutes long. Each one's got two clips. One's a bit longer than the other one, and that's going to be launching fairly soon. I've been really enjoying that. I've learned a lot about video editing, I must admit. It's been kind of trial and error process, and they've, the new ones, more recent ones, are far better than the earlier ones, but I want to make sure they're just right before I actually launch them, so that's been keeping me quite busy. So other than that, and of course, seeing clients as a therapist, that's kind of been what I've been up to, really. Excellent. Is there going to be a website that people can look for for those or um i've been designing on and off a website for my writing for years i've just never finished it um the best place to want to try and find me is often on facebook actually easiest to find andy mercer on facebook you know just um, send me a friend request if there's shared interest and i always link up with people so all right that's easy place to find you always look for the picture of andy mercer's reading a book on jung as the image that's me (laughs) (laughs) that's the giveaway (laughs) Okay, we'll remember that. All right, well, thank you for coming and visiting us again. I really enjoyed it, thank you. You're always welcome, and it's always fun. I'm sure I'll be back again. Thank you. <laughs> All oh, right. I should also say I'm still doing the um, on and off with Steve Ward, the um, High Strangers Factor, I'm occasional oh, co-host. Right. I'm also the editor of the program. I, I do produce a couple of other shows for the Paranormal UK Network. That which um, is still a thing. So yeah, should mention that. They'll, right. they'll fire me. They'll, sh- they'll throw rocks at my head if I don't tell them about that. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you not mention them? <laughs> so. All right. Thank you very much. No problem. So there you have it. That was the six degrees of John Keel interviewing me about well, as it turned out, all sorts of different things. I hope you enjoyed this little um, different show. As I say, Steve will be back with us for the next show, in which we'll be back to more normal service. But I hope you enjoyed tonight. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.